What if I were to tell you that Vision Pro now provides object tracking capabilities? Now you can use the Apple Vision Pro workflow to prepare real-world objects and convert them to digital versions, giving you the ability to run these digital versions or 3D models through Apple's machine learning object tracking algorithms. But how does it really work? What is required? And how reliable is this, right? Well. I spent the last two weeks testing all of these new features and I'm really excited to share my own experience with you today. Okay, before we get started with scanning, let's make sure that you have the following requirements. Mac OS Sequoia Beta 15.2 or greater. Keep in mind that Mac OS Sequoia is available on Mac computers with Apple Silicon and Intel-based Mac computers with a T2 security chip. Next, you'll need Xcode version 16.0 beta 2 or greater, which will include CreateML and also Reality Composer Pro. Xcode will also need VisionOS support since we're going to be building a VisionOS prototype to test object tracking capabilities. Then your Apple Vision Pro device will need to have VisionOS 2.0 or greater. If any of these versions become available in production, then you should be able to get them from the respective app stores. In the meantime, you can get the beta versions by going to developer.apple.com. Next, let's run a capture with this action figure and PS5 controller. For this, we're going to be using a guided capture iOS Xcode project, which was made available during this last WWDC, and it will allow us to create a bounding area for each object. The cool thing about this application, though, is that it automatically captures images and it creates a point cloud as you move around each object. The app gives you scan recommendations as you go through the capture process. For instance, in this case, it recommends you to do a capture at a lower angle. Next, the application allows you to export and place the generated objects in augmented reality. Then we'll repeat this process one more time with the PS5 controller. So next, we're going to be going into the file system in our mobile devices and then finding the guided capture folder. Then from there, we can basically grab all the images that were generated by the capture and then send those images to or computers by using AirDrop. All right, guys, so go into Xcode and then open Developer Tool. We're gonna find Reality Composer Pro and create a mail in here. In Reality Composer Pro, you can basically create an object capture, which is really cool. We can grab the images that we exported from the mobile application, and then we can process them by using this app. Here, you can isolate the environment, you can include the environment, you can change the resolution if you wanted to do that. And then once you're ready with the options, you can basically click on create model and that's gonna go through the process of aligning the images and basically combining them all and then creating a mesh, which is what you see right here. This model has a lot of reflections, so it doesn't really give you a really good detail model. It still works, it's going to work, it's just not that pretty. But you can see here the multiple versions, the preview, the medium quality, and also full quality. I did the same thing with the action figure and that one actually gave me a lot better results. So once you're ready to go, you can go into create a mail and then select object tracking. Then we're gonna give it a project name, in this case, random objects tracking. I'm gonna go ahead and drag and drop the toy underscore full USDZ file that got generated from the previous steps. And you can see here that we can have a view which is going to be the upright view on the viewing angles. You can also look around and just look at your model and then when you're ready, you can select which viewing angle you prefer. View angles are going to allow you to detect when we're going to be tracking a model. So you can do upright, you can do front view, or you can use all angles if you wanna track the models in all different angles. This model has an issue because it is not facing in the right direction, but I'm gonna fix it in just a minute. And then, we're gonna be creating a new source for the actual PlayStation 5 controller. And then in here, we're gonna go ahead and drag and drop a different model that I already cleaned up with the Reality Composer Pro. I'm gonna show you how we can do that with the action figure, but this is basically in the right direction. So once you are ready to fix the models, we're gonna go ahead and do that in Reality Composer Pro. And it's pretty easy. All we're gonna do is just move the object around. So once you're ready to go, just go ahead and delete the model that we have and then we can just go ahead and create a new media source and then just drag and drop the toy that we just cleaned up. So we can just go ahead and drag and drop that file and you're gonna see that that looks 
a lot better now. It is positioned correctly. So once you're ready to train, you have to just click on train and you're gonna go through this process, which is going to take a long time. So I recommend you to be very patient because it's gonna take a lot of hours. All right, guys, so this finally finished and it took quite a bit of time to train these two models, but finally got it done and I wanna show you the process of incorporating these and integrating these into Xcode. So we're gonna be using a project that I already created and I combined some of the code from WDC and some of the samples that they had for these years. So I went ahead and modified it in a way that it's gonna make it a lot easier for you, I think, to understand. So if we look at these two models though, and we are in CreateML, you can see that we have also the training section and now it's completed, it has a green mark and it took 11 hours and 43 minutes. So these took quite a bit of time. But as I was thinking about it, if you think about the use cases for this, if you are a toy manufacturer, if you are a PlayStation, if you have maybe a coffee machine that you're producing, these are things that the vendor could actually do, right? They can ship out an application or this model already trained, and then people can incorporate it into their own application. So I don't see this as bad. It does take a long time, but it depends on the use case, right? Hopefully this time goes down, you know, in future versions, which I'm pretty sure it will. And my machine is also an M1 Pro. It doesn't have the latest and greatest, so that could probably be a lot less. I asked some people that I know how long it was taking, and it was taking about eight hours to 14 hours on, on different machines that have better specs. So just keep that in mind. And then if you look at the PS5 controller, that one took quite a bit of time, 16 hours and 52 minutes. And then if you look at the output window though, that's gonna tell you what the model that was created, it's going to be the extension. So this is gonna be a reference object and anything that you get out of these with the object tracking capabilities is going to have a reference object extension and that's what we're going to be integrating into Xcode. It also tells you here that we're gonna need Vision OS 2.0 and then also the viewing angles that we use. So if you click on this get, it's gonna take you to this window and this dialog is gonna tell you, okay, what do you wanna save these as? So I'm just gonna go ahead and append the word train, that way I know that this is gonna be a train model. If we go under toy, now we can click on this one as well and I'm gonna go ahead and just name this toy underscore train. And then when you do that, if you look at that one, that one is a lot larger, I'm surprised. And this one is 61.3. I believe if the settings change though, if you don't have to do all angles, because I did all angles for both of them, that way I can rotate the models and we get tracking information for that. I would imagine like for the upright or front, it's going to be a smaller file. So I went ahead and review every single code base that was posted about object tracking. There's a hello photogrammetry, which allows you to basically create a mesh from the command line, the guided capture, that's the app that we use at the beginning of this video. And then also the Vision OS object tracking demo is a combination of some of the repos that I already looked at. So anyways, this is gonna give you basically the steps to be able to integrate it into your own Vision OS app. And I'm gonna be putting that in GitHub so that you guys have access to that. So what I'm gonna start with though, is if you create an application from scratch with you know, with Vision OS capabilities, then you can kind of look at this and look at it as an example. And we make this a little bit bigger. I'm gonna go ahead and drag them and drop them. It doesn't matter where you put them. I happen to put them under this folder, just like the examples that were provided during WWDC. So I'm gonna put it in there. And then we also need to make a change in here because we're gonna need a key for world sensing. So the key that we're gonna need is gonna be called NS and then world and it's gonna be sensing usage and description. This is just a key so that we can justify what we're using while sensing, while we're gonna be doing object tracking. So this is going to be required for that. So we're gonna say object tracking capability. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna look at is going to be the reference object loader, and that's gonna do exactly what it says that it's gonna do. We're gonna have multiple references in here to the reference object. So if you look at the definition of this, this is all gonna come in from the Vision OS 2.0. This is the reference object that we're gonna be tracking, right? So if we go back in here, this is gonna keep track of that in a variable. We also have one for the enable reference objects and then also account. And then we also have a dictionary that is gonna keep track of the reference object USDZ file because this itself has some model inside 
that we can access as well. So we're gonna have a dictionary that we can use for that. This method is gonna be very important because it's gonna be the one that executes when the application, when the Vision OS object tracking demo app executes for the first time, it's gonna try to load those files as long as object tracking capabilities are available. So this guard, it's just gonna make sure that we don't call it multiple times. Then we have a print statement here. And then this guard right here is just trying to find anything that has the reference object extension. In this case, it's called suffix. And then basically it's gonna load, it's gonna find those two files. And then it's gonna get the file count, update the progress, and then it's gonna go back in here and calculate that for us. This part right here, it's really important because it's gonna be executing a group of tasks, which is really cool. That's something that I haven't done in Swift. And this is going to basically get our list of all the different reference object files that we retrieve by looking at this extension. And then as we go through it, we're gonna be loading the object URL by passing in the file name and then executing these two different tasks. The first one is gonna be the loading of reference objects. This one is gonna take a little bit more time because if we look at the file that was 20 megabytes approximately, that needs to be loaded. And then if we look at the other one, which was about 60 megabytes, that also needs to be loaded. So there's gonna be a delay in here. There is an away. So it's gonna wait for that to happen before it executes this. Once that asynchronous call is done, then it's going to try to, it's going to basically update the files loaded and also the progress. So this method right here is the one that is really important because that's the one that is doing most of the work as far as loading it. So if you look in here, we have basically a reference object, and this is just a variable of that type. Then we're gonna do an away, and that away it's going to get the URL that we're passing in into this type. This is a part that is gonna take a while. I said this one, but that's basically the entire method. But there's gonna be a delay in here, and then when that completes, if it completes successfully, then it's gonna keep going in here. It's gonna get added to the reference objects. We're also going to be adding it to the enable reference objects. And then it's gonna try to, well, not try, but it's gonna get that USDC file from the reference object, which is cool. We have that available in here that you guys can access. And then if we have that, which is gonna be stored in here, then we can store that as an entity and that's what we need this dictionary. So it's gonna have a reference object ID that's going to be the key. And then the value, it's going to be the actual entity. This is gonna come in handy when we start adding the anchors because we're gonna need that model to be able to display the model as we're tracking the object around. We're gonna call this a start tracking and then the return type is gonna be object tracking provider and then it's gonna be asynchronous. So we're gonna be accessing the reference object loader enable reference objects. Those are the ones that we enable through the loader. And then we're gonna make sure that we do have reference objects. Otherwise there's really not need for us to start tracking anything. And then the object tracking, the way that it works, you have to specify the reference objects. So these in it includes the reference objects that we got from that reference object loader. Then once we have it here as a reference, we can start running the session with by calling run and then passing the actual tracking capability. So if you go in here and we look at the actual implementation of this, you can see that there's an in it and that in it takes an array of reference objects. And then there's also an optional tracking configuration that you can pass into that. So once you're good to go though, if everything working here, we should be getting, basically this is gonna start the session. Then we're gonna be storing the object tracking on the object tracking variable. And then we're gonna be returning. So here we're gonna be creating a new window group. The home content view is going to be a very small menu that we're going to be displaying. And then it's gonna require that we pass in an immersive space identifier, and I'll show you why that is, and also the app state. I'm also going to add a task, and you can add any task in here as you, you know, as you need. But in our case, we need to add a task when that basically gets created. We're gonna make sure that the, in this case, it's called all required providers are supported. There's only one provider that we're using, but if you wanna add more providers for your experience, then that could, you know, this could be pretty helpful. But in our case, it's gonna be object tracking capabilities. If it is supported, then we know that we can call into this load built-in reference objects, which is gonna go through this reference object loader and then go through the process that I explained to you a few minutes ago. Each visualization is going to contain basically a bounding volume, which is going to have lines that are going to be drawing the volume of each one of the, or the bounds 
of each one of the objects that we're going to be tracking. We're also going to have a model that is going to be displaying a wireframe. And then we're also going to have a text that is going to show for each model that is going to display basically what the reference object name is going to be. In the reality view, we're going to be calling into content that ad and we're going to be adding that entity. All right, guys. So what I did here is I started the actual tracker for object tracking. I'm making sure that we did get it back and it is available. If it's not null, then we can go ahead and start asking for anchor update. So let's say that we have two anchors in the field of view, meaning that we have two different objects that we're currently tracking. So in our case, it's going to be these two, right? So the actual anchor updates is going to have basically two different objects that we're going to be getting anchors for. So we're doing a wait here and then getting the current anchor because we're looping through those, getting the actual anchor ID. And then the anchor update itself for each one of the objects is going to have an event. So in the case of adding a new anchor, so whenever the controller comes into the view and it's the first time that we add it, then this case statement is going to return as added. Basically, we're going to do a switch against that. And then we're going to get the model from a reference object loader, USDZ as per reference object dictionary by passing in the reference object ID. Then we're going to be getting and creating a visualization, which is going to be taking anchor and also the model. And then if you look in here, we're also going to be creating a dictionary, which is going to be have a key, which is going to be the anchor ID and also the visualizer. So that's going to be basically stored into this property in here. And then we're going to be adding this object, this entity to the current root. And that root is going to be of type entity. So that way, when we add it, we have this visualization that is going to be tied to an anchor. And then whenever that gets updated, we want to make sure that we update the actual visualization because if the anchor gets changed, we move the object around. If we're moving and rotating it, if we're changing its position, we want to make sure that we're also updating all the visualizations that we have tracked with that object. And then the in it, it's going to be taking the anchor, also the model. We're also going to be creating a bounding box outline that is going to be requiring an anchor. That way we can, that bounding box outline can be positioned correctly and also rotated correctly. And also the value of the alpha value so that when we are creating the meshes that are going to be representing the wires, then we have an alpha value for that, right? Then we're going to be creating an entity here and then the entity transform is going to be getting that from the actual anchor. So if you want to get the transform information from the anchor, you can call into the origin from anchor transform and that's going to give you that matrix. Then if we're tracking the anchor, then we want to make sure that this is enabled, right? If we're not tracking the anchor, let's say the anchor goes and then it's not in the field of view, we want to make sure that we don't have the visibility on, on that. That way, you know, it's only when it's getting tracked that we're going to be displaying the information in that entity. Then this is going to basically create the text that is going to be representing the name of each one of the anchors that we're tracking. We also have an update method because we need to update the entity that we just created. We want to make sure that we reposition it correctly. So we can also make sure that it is still enabled. So we're tracking it by calling into the update. If it is not tracked, there's no reason for us to update this information. So if it is tracked, then let's update the transform on the actual entity, which is going to move the text. It's going to move the bounding box outline. And then the way that we update the entity transform is again, by calling into the anchor and then origin from anchor transform information, which in this case, it should be updated. And then the bounding box outline is also going to get updated.
if you wanted to add the model, I haven't added the model in here, but that's something that we can add as well. So what I'm gonna do though is, I'm gonna do that at the very end in here. So we're gonna go ahead and say let model. All right, so this is the implementation and then the last part that I need to do here is I need to call into apply material and we also need to pass in the model and then the material here that we're just creating dynamically. Well, that was a great learning experience. And even though object tracking training takes a long time and tracking is not as fast as I would like it to be, I believe there's going to be many updates on this in the near future. So it's really cool that you guys can get in right now and start testing with the version that I provided, which is the beta version. So if you guys have any other questions about this technology or you're considering using these for your own use case, let me know in the comments below. And thank you very much for your time. And don't forget to subscribe hit the notification bell so that you guys can see future videos and get notified. And also thank you very much to all my patrons for supporting my content and happy XR coding everyone.